Today's episode of The Real Deal with Damian Adams is brought to you by the 3 pointconversioncom The 3 Point Conversion is where fans' opinions matter. So you can get all your sports needs. If you need quick updates that come to you as quickly as humanly possible, the 3 Point Conversion is where it's at. If you need in-depth articles on the NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, boxing, hockey, all the sports that you want, the 3 Point Conversion is where it's at. Because it's where fans' opinions truly matter. Thank you for listening to The Real Deal with Damian Adams. This is Real Sports Talk for the Real Sports Fan. And I definitely appreciate all you Real Sports fans who are listening right now. If you're listening on iTunes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Please do not forget to give us that five-star rating, that one, two, three, four, fifth, that five-star rating and review will definitely be appreciated. If you're listening on the Three Point Conversion Station on Spreaker Radio, thank you, thank you, thank you. Please do not forget to give us your opinion on that channel as well because the Three Point Conversion Station is where fans' opinions matter. So please let us know what you think of the show. I would truly appreciate your praise or criticism. Either one, I need it to be great at what I do. And I'm very excited about today's show. It's a stacked show, man. We're going to talk about UFC 229. We're going to recap NFL Week 5. Going to preview Week 6. Talk about who are the top five quarterbacks of all time. Do a little sports trivia. Forgotten players. And I can't do all this by myself. So I have a very special guest on the line today. He is someone who is very knowledgeable when it comes to all sports. I've seen this guy talk about basketball, football, hockey, Boxing, MMA, every sport under the sun, on his very entertaining YouTube channel, the Waterboy Report. I have Mr. Luca Rosano on the line. How you doing today, Luca? Hey, how's it going, Damien? Thanks for having me, man. It's uh, it's an honor and privilege. Looking forward to uh, what we're going to talk about today. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Well, I want to start off by getting to know you a little bit. Whenever I have a guest on for the first time, I want to introduce them to my fan base. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so uh, my name's Luca, like you mentioned, and I have the YouTube channel, The Waterboard Report, which is my sports brand. And as you also alluded to, I I touch on the uh, major headlines in sports. So uh, I do NBA, I do NFL, I do NHL, I do MLB. I also mix in some uh, UFC a uh, crazy fight we had on Saturday. I know we're going to get uh, into that a little bit later on in the show. Uh, also boxing. Uh, wh- whatever's pretty much trending, man. I'm just a, a sports fan like us all, and I just try to uh, I- I bring a unique twist to it, be creative, be funny, be entertaining, and uh, just bring to the people the good sports news that's out there. And I've been doing the Waterboard Report uh, pretty steadily for about uh, uh, two years now, and uh, really going hard at the YouTube aspect now. I've been going hard at the YouTube game for about eight to eight months to a year now uh in that spectrum and uh yeah man i just uh, i like to connect with sports fans if you can't play the game talk the game is my uh motto and uh if you're a sports fan listening to this and you want to check out my channel feel free to do so yes it's a very good channel i definitely recommend it for everybody who's a sports fan you also mix in some comedy as well so i definitely recommend the channel to everybody and how did the waterboy report come about yeah so that's an interesting question it's actually the most uh the most popular question that i get when just talking on my channel a lot of people think i got the name from of course the classic football movie the water boy headlined by of course the man himself adam sandler but it actually didn't come from that movie uh damien the name came from pretty much the the notion that i always wanted to be an athlete always wanted to play in the game but I was never big enough or skilled enough to land that big deal in a major club so I tried to relate to another sports figure that isn't necessarily in the game but he's got an involvement in the game particularly on the sidelines and sees what's, sees what's going on in the game and, and, and puts in his two cents so for some reason I just related to the water boy and uh, thus became the water boy of sports reporting so uh, that's pretty much how I came up with the name it was one night in December thinking of a clever way to to pretty much uh, resemble who I am as a personality and who I am as a sports fan. And uh, the water board was born. That's a very interesting way to look at it. To be <laughs> as close to the sport as possible 
And of course, you know, I had hoop dreams as well as a basketball player growing up, but I wasn't good enough to make the pros. And it's something that, like you said, your motto, if you can't, you know, play it, at least talk about it or write about it in my aspect. Yeah. And so I really like that, that look at it. Now, you're originally from Toronto, correct? Yes, I'm, I'm still living there. Born and raised. Now, being from Toronto, you're a big Toronto Raptors fan. Do you feel that the Raptors get enough respect from the American fans? Because, you know, all the other teams are in, you know, the United States now. Of course, you know, Vancouver had a team for a little bit. But do you feel yeah. that Toronto gets enough respect? Uh, you know what? That's a good question. I don't think we get enough respect. But to be honest with you, I don't necessarily blame the public because you look at our tenures, especially over the past couple of postseasons, uh, having those great regular seasons and then not following that up with postseason success. I can see why a lot of people don't believe in this team and don't believe as, uh, in this city as being a dominant basketball city and dominant basketball organization because push comes to shove, we simply haven't delivered the past couple of years, but particularly against LeBron James. He's had our number. Everybody knows that. He swept us uh, two years in a row. So um, I'm hoping that's going to change, and I think that will change this year because, Damian, this is a big, big year coming up. This is a statement year. Of course, we know the big news. Kawhi Leonard is now a member of the Toronto Raptors. I, tr- I, tr- I truly believe that he's going to end up being the missing piece that this team needed. The guy, A veteran now because he's, he's had a couple of seasons under his belt, who's had postseason success, who has an NBA championship who has uh, an NBA Finals MVP in that series where he shut down, or at least limited LeBron, I won't say shut down. But uh, I have, I have, a, I have a, a funny feeling that he's going to do relatively well this season, and we're going to start to see that shift of respect come uh, our way after they see that we are dominating the postseason. Now let's shift back to Kawhi. What was your reaction when the trade first happened? You trade, you know, DeMar, you know, DeMar excuse me, DeMar DeRozan, and you get back... Kawhi Leonard and Danny Green. What was your initial reaction when that happened? Yeah, that was uh, that was crazy, man. It was crazy. Uh, it, was, it was it was definitely a crazy trade. I uh, I still remember the day uh, it happened. I was kind of just lost for words because I had no idea that uh, we had just traded for Kawhi Leonard. And I woke up and I'm just like, we have Kawhi Leonard. A lot of people here, Damien, a lot of people were saying that uh, they hated the move because, of course, the loyalty and what DeMar DeRozan brought to the table over his tenure with the Raptors. You cannot dismiss that. He was loyal. He didn't listen to any other offers when uh, he was eligible for a new contract. He gave us his all, so I'm not going to bash him in that respect. But uh, I was actually one of the few Raptors fans, while the move happened, who was on board with the move because, for the reasons that I just mentioned, the Raptors were always looked at as a, a regular season success, but in the postseason, we're the laughing stock of the NBA. And I feel like a guy like Kawhi Leonard, you're arguably bringing, bringing in a top five, maybe even a top three player, because when he's healthy, I think he's number three behind LeBron and KD. On this team, I really think that can bring us over the top. And I haven't been this excited and this optimistic about a Raptor season in my entire life. And I've been following the Raptors ever since I was a little boy watching those Vince Carver days. So I think a lot of people, they made their, they made their opinion based on their emotion in the, heap of, in the heap of the moment when, of course, their boy DeMar DeRozan was shipped. But thinking about it a couple months later, I'm just even more on board with this move because I think this finally will make us a legitimate contender in the Eastern Conference and could possibly even get to our first ever NBA Finals appearance. I definitely agree with that. I think that DeMar DeRozan is a very good player. But he's also someone who can be limited as far as his three-point shot. Defensively, he's nowhere near the level of a Kawhi Leonard. So you get two great defensive players like Kawhi Leonard. Danny Green's no, you know, no nothing to sneeze at on defense as well. I think you guys will be really good this year. Of course, Boston's going to have something to say about that. But I definitely agree with your analysis on that. Now, of course, there's going to be this cloud over the season because Kawhi Leonard is a free agent after this year. You gave up a lot to get him. Do you think that could negatively affect you guys going forward, the fact that he could be a free agent? And we all knew going into this past offseason that he wanted to go to L.A. before this. Is there, Luca? Yeah, can you hear me? 
I can hear you now. Do you think that the cloud of Kawhi's free agency can have a negative impact on the season? Oh, that's uh, that's a tough question, and uh, sorry about those technical difficulties. Um, you know what, man? A lot of people are looking ahead, and I think Kawhi said it best. He had a great quote. I- I'm not going to say verbatim, but he pretty much said, uh, just paraphrasing here, how uh, we shouldn't look ahead, and we should just, uh, because if we are going to look ahead, that's going to set us up for failure in the present moment. So um, I think it will cause distraction, most definitely. But the one thing that's going to put that notion to bed early is if this team wins. If this team wins and has much success, you know, we're competing for the top seed in the East again, and then we get into the playoffs, we win round one, we win round two, and then all of a sudden we have a chance to play for the NBA Finals, I think we won't even be talking about Kawhi leaving until push comes to shove and that time has arrived. But if this team at the gate stumbles, the chemistry seems to be an issue, I'm knocking on wood as I say this. Kawhi Leonard, uh, you know, he's not 100%. Uh, His injuries start to come back, and all of a sudden, this turns out to be one of the worst seasons in Raptors history, just from that perspective. And then I think that's going to overshadow the season, and then all of a sudden, we're going to talk about how this guy's as good as gone. We gave him our loyal player for pretty much nothing if he does leave. So that's why I feel like you see it now in the preseason. Guys are playing these preseason games like their playoff games, quite frankly. They got this eagerness in them. They just want to start the season because they really have a lot of people to prove. Not only the NBA, who have seen them choke over the past couple of years, but pretty much the outside NBA, who looked at this move like, what are you doing giving up uh, your you know talents for a guy who is uh, virtually gone next season, barring a miracle? So I think if they win... The culture becomes something that Kawhi likes. I mean, so far you heard uh, you heard it. Sorry, excuse me. Stories about you know Kawhi enjoying his time here in Toronto. You see him in the interviews, his laughs. He seems more lively. So I think if uh, like anything in sports, if it's a winning culture, that will cure all. And have to put you on the spot before we move on to UFC two twenty nine. What do you see the Raptors doing this year? Do they make the finals? Are they true contenders? Do they fall short again? What do you see the Raptors doing? <laughs> yeah, this is a tough question, man. And uh, I try to make my picks not based on a bias because last year uh, I-, I was proven that that uh, ended up uh, you know, hurting me because I, I truly felt the Cavs were going to beat us, but everybody was getting in my head saying, this is the Raptors' year, this is the Raptors' year. And then, of course, we got swept. I will say this, man. This year, I think it will be our best year we're going to exceed expectations, and I do have this team making it to the NBA Finals. Not because I'm being biased, once again. I truly feel this is going to be a special, special season. And I think Kawhi Leonard's going to return to the scene with the storm. And he's going to remind everyone that this guy is one of the top-tier players in this league. And uh, I think we're going to have a little bit of history. We're going to make it to the NBA Finals. But in terms of winning it all... As long as Golden State's the Golden State, there's no way we're winning at all. But I got Raptors Golden State as my NBA Finals. Okay. I'm definitely not mad at that one because the Raptors had number one seed last year, and you look better this year. Now, of course, Boston, you know, they're stacked very deep, very talented team. So I think it's definitely going to come down between those two teams in the Eastern Conference. I definitely could see Toronto making that leap this year. So now let's move on to UFC 229. It was a crazy weekend in mixed martial arts as Habib, not going to try to pronounce his last name, defeated (laughs) defeated Conor McGregor via a fourth round submission. It was with a a chokehold, but it was more of a a neck crank that really made McGregor tap out. But of course, the big story is what happened afterwards as Habib jumped over the octagon, charged after one of Conor McGregor's coaches, the the jiu-jitsu coach to be exact. And then some of Habib's team charged into the octagon and jumped McGregor while he wasn't looking. A very ugly scene, something that you don't want to see, especially when it puts fans in danger. So my first question is about the fight itself. What was your thoughts on watching the fight? Were you thoroughly entertained? Did just what you expected to see from Habib beating McGregor kind of easily? What were your thoughts on the fight itself? Yeah, the, the fight was obviously hyped, and uh, it was coined the biggest bone in UFC history. I think that's fair. In retrospect, just looking at the fight, I mean, I think it, I, I think thoroughly it was an entertaining fight. A lot of people thought it wasn't even going to go uh, two rounds, three rounds. We got a four-round fight. 
Um, I know, you know, Habib did dominate uh, the first couple of rounds pretty handedly, and then uh, McGregor had that crazy comeback when it looked like he was down and out. I remember I was watching, the, the my buddy had a, a watch party over here in Toronto, and I'm like, it's done, it's done. Because I actually went live for that to uh, for my YouTube channel. And then all of a sudden, McGregor comes back, and then it makes you believe, okay, you know, he's got momentum going into that this the, the final round or the fourth round. You know, he can very well win this thing and shock the world and, and hand Habib his first loss. But then Habib, like, what's made him the man he is today, man? Um, it's it, it's his ability to just dominate the ground game, and everybody knows that about him. Once he started with that ground game and once he got in his positions, it was game over. It was good night, McGregor. And uh, I don't want to see we saw a bit of ring rush from McGregor because I don't want to take away from Habib's performance because he was stellar. He was flawless, you can even argue. But, uh, of course, you're going to have people saying, you know, McGregor, this is his first fight in, what, two years. Ring Russ is going to pay into it. But uh, all in all, I was very, very entertained with the fight. I think it delivered. I think it's going to set up a rematch down the line. And then, I mean, as far as what happened post-fight, it pretty much explains itself, man. No one saw that coming. I was flipping out on video when I saw that. I'm like, is this UFC or WWE? I, I, like, it seemed like an NWO invasion almost. It was crazy <laughs> to see it. And, um, yeah, I think that just added to the theatrics. Obviously, it's unfortunate how it ended. I think Khabib, he does a good job of really composing himself, but he just snapped. I, uh, you heard the rumors of what was said. I'm obviously not going to repeat it, but uh, he just snapped. It was the heap of the moment, so I don't really blame him because at the end of the day, he is human. And at the end of the day, Dana White and McGregor were egging him on. So what did they expect, that he was just going to brush it off? Like, he is human. He does have feelings. Put yourself in his shoes. If it, it, it uh, you know, it, it takes so much until you just finally hit your button and, and finally snap. So we saw this guy snap coming up that emotional victory. We're gonna see the consequences, but uh, yeah, I was entertained. It was a great fight, and I think, uh, like I said, this ultimately sets up the rematch. Which boy, man, get your popcorn out! I, I cannot wait to see that. Yeah, I definitely can see a rematch happening. Um, for the fight itself, I was very entertained. Because it it showed a, just the different ways you could dominate in a fight, right? Now, I'm a boxing guy. You know, I'm someone who loves boxing, have grown up on boxing. So when it comes to the wrestling aspect of MMA, sometimes I could find it a little boring. Especially like the first round, for yeah. example. When Habib just was dominating McGregor on the ground, but he wasn't really throwing punches. He just was dominating on the ground, not letting him get up. And he was doing the technique where he was straightening out McGregor's legs to where McGregor really couldn't do anything but just have it back against the cage to make sure that he didn't get, you know, ground and pound. But that aspect of it can get a little boring. I think at certain times the referee should get him up if there's no ground and pound happening. Get him up. See what we can do standing up. Because sometimes as the actions on the ground can get a little boring for me. But overall I thought it was pretty entertaining, especially second round when Habib really dominated, you know, landed a nice right hand, had some ground and pound. You mentioned the third round, which I thought McGregor won because they were standing up most of the time, which is McGregor's strength. And then Habib took advantage in the fourth round. Now, what happened afterwards? Of course, you know, you don't want to see that. You understand from an emotional standpoint how Habib felt. You know, it talked about all the things that McGregor's camp said about, you know, him, his family, his religion, his country. And those things are taken very seriously, you know, in his culture. So you understand the frustration, but you have a legal way to take that anger out. Like you have, this is one of the few things in society where you have a legal right to beat someone up and to take your anger out. Yeah. And you did that in the ring, did a great job of it. But once you do that, you have to just let it go. Now you can talk all the trash you want afterwards. Like once he gets the belt on him, he can talk all the trash about McGregor, about the Irish, whatever you wanted to do. But you can't, you know, spill over into the crowd. Even if you want to see that jujitsu coach somewhere else, you know, see him in private, meet in the gym somewhere, but do not do it there at the event. So that's just, you know, it's just yeah. not no good there. My question to you is, what do you think the punishment should be? Do you think Khabib should get stripped of his title? Should he be suspended for a little while? Should it just be a heavy fine? What do you think the punishment should be for Khabib and also his team that jumped uh, McGregor? 
Yeah, that's obviously, uh, you know, the talk of the sports world right now. But uh, before I answer that, yeah, I just want to say I, I agree with your points that you, uh, that you just made because for as dominant as Habib looked and for as impressive of a win that was, it's unfortunate because he's always going to be defined of what happened post-fight. We're not going to remember him necessarily for just beating McGregor. We're always going to remember the baggage that came afterwards. So, uh, yeah, we're going to see what the punishment is going to be. We've heard rumors, the title strip, you know, the fine for $2 million. Uh, uh, it's tough to say, man. It's tough to say. And uh, Dana White's definitely got a decision on his hands. If I had to go on record just to make a guess, I mean, do you get rid- do you strip him of the title? Uh, uh, I guess you would go that route. You know, it's very tough to say. I think if they did find him, it'd be a couple million bucks. $2 million, but if they really went to the extent of stripping him of his title, which would set up the rematch, I can see that happening just from a storyline perspective. I mean, this is already already taken the route of a WWE storyline, so I can definitely see him uh, being stripped of the title, uh, being fined a couple million dollars, and then uh, this fight taking place in 2019 to uh, crown the uh, winner of the vacated title. That's a very good point. You can strip him of the title and set up the storyline that way. I definitely see that. But I don't think the rematch is a certainty. You have another fight in that division who fought on the same card in Ferguson who has a right to that title as well. He never lost it. He got stripped because he was injury he was injury prone and was not able to defend the title in the ring. So he's someone who's saying, hey, I did my job. I beat Pettis in a great fight. It was very entertaining. Did my job. I should be next in line to fight against a McGregor or against Habib. And I think Ferguson shouldn't have to wait. Do you think that it would be fair to Ferguson if the rematch happens? No, and that's a good point because Ferguson and uh, you know, arguably they had the, the best fight of the night. So Ferguson, he showcased his dominance. He came away with a, a grueling win. And that's a really good point. All of a sudden, Ferguson's entered in the picture. So... It'll be interesting to see how this thing pans out, man. I think, end of the day, we will see some rematch, though. That's just my gut telling you we will see a rematch because that is a big money fight. And then post-fight, what had happened, it's just a perfect follow-up. But uh, I can also see Ferguson getting to the mix as well. So that's definitely fair to say. Yeah. And as far as the punishment, I would say that Habib, if you're not going to strip the title, you definitely have to find him heavily. I believe his purse for the yeah. fight was $2 million. So I wouldn't find him the whole two mil. I would go five hundred thousand, and you know, like a six month suspension. But it has to be something strong. You have to really put your imprint on this if you're Dana White and show that this is not acceptable in your sport. You don't want your sport to be known for incidents like this. You know, the exactly. UFC is all the good things that happened. This is you know, yeah, great fight there. You talk about the Ferguson fight. You had the Derek Lewis comeback knockout and the great post fight interview. All those great things got overshadowed by this incident. So you don't want this, you know, you don't want the lack of punishment to be another story. Like with the NFL, it seems like a lot of times we're not even talking about the crime itself. We're talking about the lack of punishment for the crime when the commissioner doesn't come down heavy enough. You don't want that to be the same story with the UFC. Yeah, I agree. Now, speaking of Derek Lewis, I just saw that he is going to fight Daniel Cormier pretty soon here like three weeks uh, for UFC, yeah. UFC 230 what are your thoughts on that yeah it's uh, November 3rd I believe uh, Saturday Night Showdown um, it's interesting man I, I see a lot of people saying that uh, Derek Lewis is uh, you know rushed into this that uh, he's just going to be a, a, a preliminary round if you will for uh, DC as of course we're going to get uh, DC and Lesnar inevitably so uh, I don't know if Lewis is necessarily ready for this fight he, he looked impressive though in, in that comeback knockout I mean seconds away from the decision and in, in where he was going to most likely lose was knocking him out that, that that was that was crazy that was the, one of the brighter moments of the night like you alluded to um I, I think yeah I don't know I think it's it's gonna exploit Lewis for obviously his uh you know his his cardio not being there and uh maybe not being up to that top tier level just yet, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm definitely gonna have my eyes on that match, but I think uh, ultimately DC is just gonna take care of business and uh, move on to the next. What are uh, what was your thoughts with that? Yeah, I agree with you. I feel like Lewis said it himself that he's not ready for a title shot at this moment. His gas tank isn't filled enough, and we saw it in that fight. He was very tired, 
But because he had such great power, he was able to end with one shot. And, you know, Daniel Cormier is very smart. He's going to, you know, keep him on the ground, stay away from that power, that punching power, and make sure that he uses the lack of conditioning that Lewis has against him. So I think that, yeah, some people are right when they say that this is just going to be a tune-up fight for Cormier, for Lewis, or for John Jones down the road again. So I definitely agree with that, even though Lewis is very entertaining. I don't think he's ready for this moment. I wish he would have got, you know, more time, especially. Because if it was, if the fight was scheduled for next year, I'd be like, okay, he has time to train, get himself ready, improve. But with it being only three weeks away, that's what makes me so skeptical about his chances. Yeah, it's tough, for sure. So now let's move on to the NFL. We just got finished with week five. So we're going to go over the matchups and give our takeaways on each matchup. So Thursday night, we had the Patriots defeat the Colts. 38-24, 38-24, to the Patriots are now 3-2, and the Colts are 1-4. and In the game, Andrew Luck went 38-59, for 365 yards, 3 touchdowns, and 2 picks. Um, he also, his main receiver was the tight end, Eric Ebron, who had 9 receptions for 105 yards. Tom Brady had another Tom Brady-like day, 34-44, for 44, 341 yards, 3 TDs, 2 picks. But those 2 interceptions were tip balls that weren't his fault. For Sonny Michelle, the rookie running back, had 18 carries for 98 yards and a touchdown. And James White had 10 receptions for 77 yards and a touchdown. What were your takeaways from this matchup? That the Indianapolis Colts are a depleted roster. A completely depleted roster. I mean, you're looking at this week, uh, they're just looking to fill up the roster with so many injuries. Yeah, it was it was one of those games, as you expected. The Patriots on prime time. Thursday nighter. Brady on three days rest on a Thursday nighter had never been defeated. He continued his dominant reign and all of a sudden the the world was coming to an end when New England got off to a one and two start. Don't look now. They have back to back impressive wins and uh, oh by the way they play Patrick Mahomes on Sunday Night Football this week. I think the Colts it's tough man because you look at a guy like Andrew Luck he always gives it his all. They were they were actually in that game for about the first half third quarter and then the inevitable Patriots dominant run in the fourth completely blew the game wide open and I, it's going to be one of those seasons for the Colts They're, it, it seems like every year is a struggle to stay healthy that whole line is always a disaster Andrew Luck's having to throw the ball like 50-60 times a game whenever that happens you're not going to win too many ball games sure the guy's going to come back here and there and put his team on his back to win a few games but that, this isn't a playoff team right now and I'm kind of upset about that because I thought this Colts team was going to be a little bit better um, out of the gate. I did have them making the playoffs, but of course, you can never plan for injuries happening the way they did. So the Colts are going to move on. They got a, another tough test this week in New York against a, a very good home team in the uh, New York Jets who are coming off like shellac and against the Broncos. And uh, if you're the a Patriots, you had Edelman back looking good. Uh, the, the Brady to Josh Gordon connection seems to be uh, really good out of the gate. So uh, the Patriots are looking as dangerous all of a sudden after we had ridden them off through three weeks. Yeah, they definitely look pretty good. Now, the question is, they looked good against Miami, who may have been a fraudulent 3-0 and team. They look like they may just have fooled us for the first three weeks. And, of course, you mentioned how the Colts have a depleted roster. There were so many drop passes in this game from the Colts. Their receiving core definitely isn't up to par. You know, There were some beautiful passes by Andrew Luck that were just dropped, and there's no excuse for that. And the Patriots, they look pretty good, but like I said, I want to see them against Kansas City this week. I think that's going to be a really good test. For the next matchup, we had the Buffalo Bills defeat the Tennessee Titans 13-12. Buffalo is now 2-3. and three. The Titans fell to 3-2. and two. Josh Allen went 10 for 19, 82 yards, one pick. LaShawn McCoy had 24 carries for 85 yards. And Marcus Mariota went 14 for 26, 129 yards in this game. I didn't watch this game, but it sounds like an ugly game to watch. It sounds like something that I didn't miss too much. What were your takeaways from this matchup? Yeah, I had it vaguely on the TV, you know, checking in here and there. But I actually predicted this upset win. I mean, how about Tennessee? These guys, they make me laugh sometimes. They come away with impressive wins. Mariota looks like he's yeah he's having a great time out there and then they come into a game in which they're expected to win and they lose that's kind of like the Tennessee Titans right they they lose games they're expected to win and then they uh, they win games that they're expected to lose and that's kind of how their season's gone so far yeah this was an ugly game man right from the get-go nitty-gritty you know the, the game the game won uh, in the trans- uh, trenches 
um, one of those performances. And uh, the, the Buffalo Bills, they came away with another upset win. I mean, the Bills, for as bad as they've been, they still have two wins on the season. Many people were talking about how this team could challenge for an 0-16 season but based on how bad they look after the first two weeks. I mean, you had Vontae Davis retiring at halftime for crying out loud. But uh, th- 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 this is this is a Bills team. I think they're going to be in a lot of games. They're going to be competitive. I think they're going to be competitive this week against the Texans. And I'm just loving the development of Josh Allen. I think this guy is going to be a decent quarterback for this team. And, uh, yeah, right now the Bills are just trying all what they have, whereas the Titans... I think it's going to be a real big test this week against my Baltimore Ravens. They're going to be at home in a, in a very big uh, AFC game, and uh, let's see if they can uh, rebound nicely or if, uh, or if they're going to let the Ravens just stomp all over them. Yeah, I definitely agree with your takeaways from this matchup. The Titans just always seem to let you down whenever you put any type of faith in them. Marcus Mariota, I've never been a big fan of his. I think he's very inconsistent. Some days he could seem like... One of the best quarterbacks out there when he mixes in great passing with his running ability. And in other games, you see the inaccuracy come out and just him not being able to produce. The Bills are just a tough team that's going to bring it every week. right? They may lose. like They lost against Green Bay. They got shut out, but they still made Green Bay work. So they're going to show pride. They might not have the most talent, but they're going to make you work for the victory. For the next matchup, we had the Carolina Panthers. Win this game by the skin of their teeth against the Giants, 33-31. They're now 3-1. and one. The Giants fell to 1-4. and four. Eli Manning, who I like to call the best average quarterback of all time, went 22-36, for 36, 326 yards, 2 TDs, 2 picks. Normal Eli Manning day. Odell Beckham Jr. had 8 receptions for 131 yards, 1 touchdown, and also threw a touchdown. Cam Newton went 24-35, for 35, 237 yards, 2 TDs, and 2 picks. Christian McCaffrey had 17 carries for 58 yards in this matchup. But the star of the game was Graham Cano, who hit the game winner from 63 yards, and it could have been good from 70. That was a kick. I don't know if I've ever seen a kick like that in the game, but he really booted that one. What are your takeaways from this matchup? Yeah, Graham Cano, he's uh, got a, a, a mega leg because, like you said, that thing could have just kept going. Probably could have hit it from 70. Yeah, the, the, the Panthers... They got out to that lead, and then I think they were a little bit lax in their approach, allowed the Giants to come back as they do, it seems, this season on the road. And uh, the Giants looked pretty good. I thought at one point they were going to take the game. Uh, Eli Manning made some clutch throws. You mentioned uh, OBJ throwing a touchdown of his own. Barkley had uh, two touchdowns, I believe. So uh, this, was a com- this was a complete second half, it seemed, from the Giants. And it looked like they were going to steal one on the road against Carolina. But, uh, yeah, good note was the savior, was the hero, and uh, you look at this Giants team now, man, they just look completely deflated, sitting at 1-4, and four, and to me, it's just the, it's the, uh, the behind the scenes, it's the off-the-field issues right now, overshadowing, of course, the, the, the biggest talk coming in where it was, of course, that uh, interview that uh, OBJ had, I don't even know who was interviewing him, but I saw a little Wayne beside him, and pretty much he, he didn't come to the, uh, to the defense of his teammates or his quarterback. And I just don't like that stuff. At the end of the day, you just got that big contract. You're a professional. You're you're arguably the best player on the team. You you got to stand up for your teammates. Now I, I know life's not good right now. You're not winning. You're very frustrated. But you can show that, especially being who you are and having that merit. You got to stand up for your teammates. You got to stand up for you in that position. And you can't let the media in because once you let the media in, we've seen this so many times. Maybe you let the media in. They make problems bigger than what they are. And once the media's in on your team and your psyche, it's pretty much a lost season. You become the, uh, the the laughing stock of the league for that reason. So I wasn't fond with that at all. That's one of the areas that I don't like OBJ for. He's a phenomenal player. Hey, he did really well for my uh, fantasy uh, team this week. But he's definitely got to keep the off-the-field issues out of the melts of the media members. And uh, for the Giants, life moves on, man. They're going to have another big game playing Philadelphia. And uh, Carolina moves on to take on the uh, the Redskins. Yes, both of those are very interesting matchups coming up. For As far as the OBJ situation, I'm kind of looking at it from a selfish perspective as a reporter. I would love to have athletes be this candid all the time. But I definitely yeah. <laughs> understand why as the team or a teammate, you don't want your teammates being so honest. Right, if you have a problem with the passing offense, you have to bring it up to the coach. Work with Eli. Try to find a way to make it work. 
I think one thing that's been overstated is the offensive line struggles. The offensive line is actually playing average. If you look at the amount of times that Eli is pressured, it's right there with the average in the league. So it's more Eli feeling pressure that isn't there and not getting the ball downfield. So I understand OBJ's frustrations. You know, last week they played against the Saints. Me being a Saints fan, of course, I watched that game. And there's times where Eli just isn't looking down the field. He has time in the pocket. And there's a lot of quote unquote coverage sacks that were we were getting, but OBJ's wide open. And you saw that frustration come out in that game when he's on the sideline screaming. And that's one thing you know comes with OBJ. When he when you gave him that big contract, you knew his um, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. So that's something that, you know, maybe he'll get better with as he gets older. Or maybe that's just him. But that's something that you have to just at this point deal with with, with Odell Beckham because that's his personality. Yeah, I know for sure. As a coach, you hate it, but like you said, as a as a journalist, you love that stuff. So <laughs> I can agree with you there. For the next matchup, we had the Cincinnati Bengals come back to defeat the Dolphins. They were down seventeen to nothing and came back and won twenty seven seventeen. They are now four and one. The Dolphins fell to three and two. Andy Dalton went twenty for thirty, two hundred and forty eight yards, one TD, one interception. Joe Mixon twenty two carries for ninety three yards. AJ Green had six receptions for 112 yards. Ryan Tannehill went 20 for 35, 185 yards, one TD, and two interceptions. What are your takeaways from this game? The Dolphins are who we thought they were because the Dolphins blew a real big opportunity here. I mean, you were up 17 to nothing. I'm flipping through the scores, Damien, and I see the score line. I picked the Bengals to win the game, so I wasn't too upset after that happened. But how do you let this game slip away? The Bengals, relentless, not giving up. They, they, they get on the board. They have that big fumble for a touchdown. I believe it was in the third quarter. Mixon's having a great season. I have him also on my fantasy team. He's one of those uh, you know under-the-radar running backs this season that's really starting to come onto the scene. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, yeah, the Bengals, they look, I want to say legitimate, but I'm going to... I'll, I'll say that if they can beat the Steelers this week, because, of course, that's a huge divisional game to see if the Bengals are going to be the different Bengals and not the, the same old team that we, we've we come to know. But if you're the Dolphins, yeah, fraudulent 3-0 team is the perfect way to put it. You come off 3-0, you lay an absolute egg against the Patriots, wasn't even competitive, got blown out, at least put up a fight, and then you have the lead on the road in a pretty big early AFC showdown, and you simply just let it go away. Like, I, 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 I saw bits and pieces of this game, and from what I remember in the second half, the Dolphins just looked like a team that was not playoff bound. They made a lot of mental mistakes, and you got to give a ton of credit to the Bengals because they did not give up. They kept the pedal to the metal. And they came away with a big, big, big comeback, uh, come from behind victory. So uh, we'll see how that propels them moving forward here. And we'll see how the Dolphins rebound for us this week at home against the Bears. Yeah, the Dolphins, like you said, they are who we thought they were. They're the same Miami Dolphins who are probably going to end up 8-8. Eight and eight, right? That's the type of team they look like. For the Bengals, this game shows some mental toughness. Being down 17, you could easily pack it in. Say, this is a bad one. You know, we will come back stronger next time. But they came back. And maybe they're showing that they can finally get out of the first round of the playoffs. We'll see. For the next matchup, we had the Browns defeat the Ravens in overtime. They are now 2-2-1. The Ravens fell to 3-2. Score was 12-9. Joe Flacco went 29 for 56. 298 yards. One interception. Baker Mayfield went 25 for 43, 342 yards, one TD, one pick. What are your takeaways from this matchup? Uh, it's frustrating to watch, man, as a Ravens fan, because I saw this comment. Whenever the Ravens, they're riding a, a bit of a high, and they come into a game that they should take care of business, they uh, they just don't they don't get the job done. And uh, a lot of that, I don't want to place all the blame, because I know he's been getting a lot of blame this past week. But, of course, uh, Crabtree for uh, dropping uh, what would have been the touchdown in the end zone. That was a sure-handed touchdown, just a, a mental mistake. Uh, yeah, there's no other way of putting that. That's a game they should have won. The Browns, they like to play these close games. I don't know what it is. Three overtime games in five games so far this season. And don't look now, but the Brownies can possibly make a push for the playoffs if they continue to win these, these games and 
continue to uh, pull it off. I mean, this team, now I know I'm, I'm talking out on a limb here, but if everything went perfect for the Browns, we're looking at a perfect team. I mean, I mean they played an ultra-competitive game against your Saints. They, uh, they've been keeping games close and, and keeping things interesting. So uh, for the Browns, they're going to have another big game against the Chargers, a team that they've actually had quite success over for as bad as they've been over the past couple of years. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that game pans out. And if you're the Ravens, you guys just get over that. I like Flacco, though. He came to the aid of his receiver. He kind of said, don't worry about it, because I know you want to sometimes be tough in those situations and get on the players for their mental mistakes. But at the end of the day, it's still a long NFL season. One game, for the most part, doesn't make you lose out on the season. Sometimes it does, but most times it doesn't. So uh, I expect the Ravens to bounce back as uh, I haven't beaten the Tennessee Titans looking ahead here. Okay, yes, for your Ravens, I was surprised that they lost this matchup because they have such a great defense. I thought that they would be able to score enough against the Browns to win this matchup, even if they didn't score that much. You know, I think I predicted 17-14 to 14 for the Ravens going into that game. And for the Browns, you're right, man. This team has the talent to make the playoffs. They should have beat my Saints, to be honest with you. Their kicker at the time, you know, left eight points on the board, if I remember correctly, in that game. So you just have to look at their talent on defense and what Baker Mayfield providing that spark on offense and say that this team has a legit shot to make the playoffs, especially in the AFC North, where we just mentioned how the Bengals have had years where we just, you know, they start off fast and may go down. The Steelers are up and down right now. So you have a legit shot, man. So we definitely something to look forward to throughout the rest of the season. For the next matchup, I watched this whole game. It was crazy as the Lions defeated the Packers 33-31, excuse me, to 23. They are now 2-3. and three. The Packers fell to 2-2-1. Two, two and one. Aaron Rodgers went 32 for 52, 442 yards and three touchdowns. He also had two fumbles lost in this matchup. Mason Crosby, longtime kicker, someone who's been very dependable throughout his career. Definitely did not have a dependable day as he missed four field goals and an extra point. So that's 13 points he left on the board. Now, one field goal was from 56 yards, but the other three were in very makeable distance. You're inside a dome. No excuse at all to miss all those field goals. Also, Matthew Stafford went 14 for 26. Not very impressive. 183 yards, two touchdowns. Kerryon Johnson had 12 carries for 70 yards. And Galladay had four receptions for 98 yards and one touchdown. What were your takeaways from this matchup? Oh, man, Mason Crosby, are you kidding me? Yeah, I, I've never seen a mental collapse. I think that's the best way to put this performance. It was a, a straight-up mental collapse because Crosby surely isn't that bad or else he uh, wouldn't be playing right now in the National Football League. He blew this game for the Packers. I mean, I hate to put the pressure and I hate to put the blame on one player, but you look at the numbers, he left 16 points off the board. The Packers, they lost by, what was it, 8? So you do the math there. Packers should have won this game, and it's and you got to look at the field goal being missed. When your kicker misses a field goal, it just demoralizes your team for that for that set period of time because you drove the ball. Now you have no points to show for. All of a sudden, the offense on the other team they have a short field to work with. So this is a game that the Packers had no business losing. I mean, the Lions they look good at the beginning of the season course beating the Patriots but this isn't a playoff team I think this is a team that's still trying to figure themselves out trying to see what they have out there there's no way a team like Green Bay that many of us have in the playoffs including myself should be losing to especially in that manner and it's crazy to me Damien that for as bad as Crosby was the Packers still had a chance at winning this game Rodgers had a spectacular second half willed this team almost came all the way back but when your kicker keeps missing field goals it's 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 really it's next to impossible to have to overcome that and then win. So that's what we saw. And uh, Green Bay is liking that they're going to return home against a very depleted San Francisco 49ers team because that was just ugly for them. Yeah, it definitely was an ugly game. And I'm not going to put all the blame on Mason Crosby, even though you know he left a lot of points out there. The Packers started off slow. You know they were down 24 to nothing. Now of course part of that is. Mason Crosby missing field goals, but also Aaron Rodgers not being careful with the ball, you know, not feeling pressure coming behind him, had two fumbles lost. And defensively, they start off a little slow with the turnovers, getting on short fields. And now in the second half, the Lions 
just weren't producing at all. So the Packers didn't have a chance to come back. But they, if they would have started off faster by getting you know maybe touchdowns instead of settling for field goals, this matchup could have had a whole different outcome. So I'm not gonna put it all on Crosby, but he definitely has to feel you know the weight of it on his chest right now. For the next matchup, this was a very highly you know anticipated matchup as we had the Kansas City Chiefs go against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Kansas City won 30 to 14. It was not close at all as they moved to five and zero. Jacksonville is now three and two. Blake Bortles, he went 33 for 61, 430 yards, great fantasy day. But, of course, you know, fantasy doesn't equal reality. One touchdown, four interceptions. Patrick Mahomes went 22 for 38, 315 yards and two picks. What are your takeaways from this matchup? A couple things. I don't trust Blake Bortles on the road whatsoever. The Jags, they, yeah, they simply just laid an egg in this game and then on the flip side of things you look at the Kansas City Chiefs they impressed me because for one their young phenom their young sensation Patrick Mahomes he finally didn't have a perfect game we saw him throw what was it two interceptions but he still battled through that and he made some pretty nice throws and he continued to battle and that was the most impressive part for me David because usually when you see a kid on this high balling out not making any mistakes all of a sudden run into a bit of problems you see more times than not, he, he then fails and he then lets that get to him and then you see the numbers fall. But Mahomes, all credit to him. He stayed in there. He played a great game, minus those couple of errors. And uh, another big thing in this one, we've seen the Chiefs steamroll past teams on their way to victories this season. So it was nice to see that their defense came to play in this one because a lot of people aren't taking this team as serious as a Super Bowl threat just because their defense isn't up to par just yet. But if this defense can start saying, hey, the offense is pretty good, but we can play just as good, then this Chiefs team is going to be really dangerous. And they're going to need that defense this week if they want any chance against the Patriots. But this was a game I expected the Chiefs to take care of business. They did that. They're 5-0. and And uh, the Jags, they've been a little bit shaky out of the gate here. A lot of people said that this was uh, a team that uh, had a lot of people to prove wrong, that they weren't just a, a one-year wonder and a fluke. And uh, so far, it's been a very up-and-down 50-50 season for them. So it'll be interesting to see how the rest of their campaign pans out. Yeah, I'm a little scared about my Super Bowl pick. I picked the Saints versus the Jaguars. And the Jaguars, because they have such a great defense, I believe that Blake Bowles is going to take a step forward this year. And certain games you see it. Like when they play against the Patriots, Blake Bowles looked like a Pro Bowl type quarterback. But against the Chiefs who have going into this game the worst defense in the league, you know, or second worst, is one of the, the two worst defenses, you expected Blake to be the good Blake in this game and it just he just wasn't. And some of the passes are just horrible. <sighs> he just it frustrates you, man. And the fact that he had to throw the ball sixty one times is not the formula for success. Not at all. You definitely don't want him throwing the ball that much. You would much rather him having, you know, 35 pass attempts compared to 61. But, of course, that's also hurt by the fact that Leonard Fournette has not been healthy all year for them. So once he comes back, that'll definitely help him out. Their defense is still great. You know, the turnovers didn't help their defense in this game. But Kansas City, man, they look good. Now, they started off last year 5-0 as well. But, of course, for Patrick Mahomes, it looks a little different this year. Now, for the next matchup, this was stunning to me. As the Jets just beat up on the Denver Broncos, thirty-four to sixteen. The Jets are now two and three. Denver also fell to two and three. Case Keenum went thirty-five of fifty-one, three hundred and seventy-seven yards, two touchdowns, one pick. Demarius Thomas had five receptions for one hundred and five yards, one touchdown. Sam Darnold didn't have to do too much as the running game took over. He went ten for twenty-two, hundred ninety-eight yards. They have three passing touchdowns, one pick. Isaiah Crowell, as he was sitting on my fantasy bench. 15 carries for 219 yards and one touchdown. And Bilal Powell also had a good uh, good game with 20 carries for 99 yards. Man, what were your takeaways from this matchup? I didn't see this coming, Damian. Straight to the point, I didn't see this coming, and I was uh, very wrong. I, I thought the Denver Broncos were going to win this game. Their defense looked very, very suspect. That is unlike uh, the Broncos' defense, especially what was displayed in the early part of the season. The the Jets, you look at the history of this team, for as bad as they've been in terms of not being a postseason team for uh, a couple years now, they actually proved to be a very, very tough home team. And 
uh, this proved true in this game. And the Denver Broncos, they proved to be a very, very bad away throw team, which also proved to be true in this game. I, I, I don't know what was going on here. I, I, I fully expected the Broncos to, uh, to take care of business. They failed to do that. But uh, it's, it's a crazy thing in the NFL where one team can look terrible. But uh, maybe this Broncos team at home, I think they're, they're going to make things interesting against the Rams, just looking ahead a little bit here. But, uh, yeah, the Jets got a big win. Darnold looked good. Everything was clicking for them. The run game was going. And uh, we'll see if they can make it two home wins in a row as they got Andrew Luck uh, coming to town. Yeah, I was shocked, man, because Denver, I know their defense isn't the defense of the past, you know, the one they won a Super Bowl with. But you still expect their defense to be good, to be solid. And this game, to get run over the way they did, just physically dominated, is shocking. The fact that you had Crowell to have 219 yards on only 15 carries. And Powell also had almost 100 yards on 20 carries. So you're looking at over 300 yards rushing from two backs. That's just phenomenal on the Jets you know, aspect of it. To be, You're keeping your, your young quarterback... You know, make sure he doesn't have to do too much. And for Denver, you know, they want to run the ball. But when you get behind this, you can't run the ball. We're seeing a trend as we're going through the games here. It seems like the teams whose quarterback has to throw the ball over 50 times, they're losing. So with Case yeah. Keenum having to throw the ball over 50 times again, that trend keeps coming. You have to be more balanced in this league unless you have, you know, the Drew Breeses and Tom Breeze of the world. You have to be more balanced. And Case Keenum is now on that level, so you definitely don't want him throwing the ball over 50 times. For the next matchup, we had Pittsburgh put a whooping on Atlanta. Pittsburgh's now 2-2-1 after defeating Atlanta 41-17. Atlanta fell to 1-4. Big Ben Roethlisberger went 19 for 29. 250 yards, three touchdowns, one pick. James Conner had 21 carries for 110 yards, two touchdowns. Antonio Brown had six receptions for 101 yards, two touchdowns. Matt Ryan went 26 for 38, 285 yards, one touchdown. Not a bad day, but they obviously could not keep up with the offensive output of Pittsburgh. And as a Saints fan, it just warms my heart to see Atlanta lose like this. You know, for people who don't know, it's a very real rivalry between the Saints and the Falcons down here in the South. And I would really appreciate Pittsburgh flipping on Atlanta like that. But what were your takeaways from that matchup? Yeah, you were loving this, man. You were loving every minute of it. I, I saw this coming, Damien. I, I predicted uh, a big-time home win for the Steelers. They weren't going to lose uh, back-to-back uh, home games. So uh, I fully expected this rebound from them. Atlanta looks like a mess right now. Their defense looks awful. Now, I want to say that this, uh, yeah, Matt Ryan actually left the game in the fourth, so we don't even know his status. He, uh, he might not even be 100% for this week. But I totally forgot that Matt Schwab was in the NFL and was the Atlanta Falcons' <laughs> backup. So I, I was very shocked when I saw a Schwab sighting. I thought this guy was long gone. But uh, all jokes aside, this Falcons team, one of the more disappointing teams, if not the most disappointing team this NFL season. I, it was between the Falcons and the Saints when I'm talking about my Super Bowl prediction. And luckily for me, I found it in my heart to go with your Saints to represent the NFC in the Super Bowl. That's looking really good right now because if I went with the Falcons, I would have just been scratching my head. This team, right from the get-go, they didn't look good against the Eagles. Sloppy game. Their defense has looked like the worst. I'm pretty sure they're the worst defense in the league. They've just been giving a ton of yardage, ton of points. And uh, the Steelers got a win that they needed here at home. Connor was going, Big Ben made a four of of nice throws, and uh, this is exactly how I expected it to be. A a very, very dominant victory for the Pittsburgh Steelers over a team that uh, is just going to have one of those years. I hate to say it, but the the Atlanta Falcons, they're pretty much done. Yeah, I agree with that. I think they're done. The injuries on defense have definitely taken their toll. I expected Pittsburgh to win, but I didn't expect it to be in this fashion. I was was a little shocked that they were just blowing them out in this way. But Pittsburgh has that talent, man. We know they have that talent level. They should get Bell back in a couple of weeks. So this team could be right there, back contending again. And we'll see what they do with the Triple Bs there. For the next matchup, we had the Los Angeles Chargers. I always have to stop and make sure I don't say San Diego. We had the Los Angeles Chargers defeat the Oakland Raiders 26-10 to in a pretty dominant performance they are now three and two oakland fell to one and four 
Derek Carr went 24 for 33, 368 yards, one touchdown, one pick. Marshawn Lynch, who's been quietly having a good year, did not have a good game. Only nine carries for 31 yards. Phillip Rivers went 22 for 27, 339 yards, two TDs. Uh, Melvin Gordon, 19 carries, 58 yards, a touchdown. And Keenan Allen, who's quietly one of the best receivers in the league, had eight receptions for 90 yards. What are your takeaways from this matchup? That Derek Carr lied to all of us because he said if he ever had a, a, a opportunity or a position where he can, uh, or on the one yard line, he would just hand the ball off to Marshawn Lynch. But instead, he threw it in the exact same situation and he got picked in the end zone. I got to tell you, man, outside of the Falcons, we're talking about the most disappointing teams this season, at least from my perspective, my opinion. You got to put the Raiders up there right below them, if not above them. This is a team. That is just a dumpster fire right now. I know they got the win, first one of their season. But that's a game they should have lost, too, because you look at the replays. I think the referees screwed them in that game with the spot of the ball late in the fourth quarter, bringing that game into overtime. So right now, this Raiders team should be winless because they are playing like a winless football team right now. They look absolutely terrible out there. I don't know what to make of this team anymore. The Chargers beat up on the worst team in the NFL because that's what the Raiders are right now. So... Nothing more to be said. John Gruden, still can't believe you traded away Khalil Mack. This team is in shambles. And if you're a Raiders fan right now, I just feel bad for you. Because I thought the Raiders, I didn't have them as a playoff team, obviously. But I thought they were going to be much better than this. Be in games, win anywhere from six to eight games. But the way they're going, they'd be lucky if they can win three to four games at this rate. Yeah, I agree with you. I thought once they traded away Khalil Mack... I thought their season was thrown away right there because you're showing that you're just waiting for Vegas. Like with Gruden having a 10-year contract, he's in no hurry to win. He has job security. So he's in a situation where he's like, okay, I can build for the future. I can trade away, get these picks. Now the future, you know, is to be determined. If those picks turn out to be great, then the trade won't look too bad, you know, a few years from now. But as of right now, Khalil Mack, I believe by himself, has better stats than Oakland's defense as a whole, which is crazy (laughs) just to think about that. But once you made that trade, you let all of Oakland know we don't care about this year. We're waiting until we move to Vegas to be competitive. And like you said, for the Chargers, they beat up on a bad team, so you can't really give them too much credit. We'll see going next week. For the next matchup, we have the Minnesota Vikings, who held on against the Philadelphia Eagles 23-21. Minnesota's now 2-2-1. Two, two and one. Philadelphia fell to 2-3. and three. Kirk Cousins went 34-37, 301 yards, one touchdown. Latavius Murray, 11 carries for only 42 yards. Adam Thielen, for the fifth game in a row, went over 100 yards, which is the first time in history someone has started the year with five straight 100-yard performances. All my fantasy teams, so I really appreciate that. He had seven receptions for 116 yards and one touchdown. Carson Wentz went 24-35. 311 yards, two touchdowns. Zach Ertz had 10 receptions for 110 yards and one TD. So how did you see this matchup? Yeah, this was, uh, not to two more off my own horn here, but this was another uh, mini upset that I saw coming. I had the Vikings in this game. It was, uh, I think, I, I just thought it was a, a great spot for them coming off of that uh, loss uh, the previous week against the Rams. It's, I think we're seeing a typical case here of the Super Bowl hangover for the Eagles. Obviously dealing with uh, Foles struggling out of the gate. Then you have to adapt with Wentz coming back from that injury, making sure he's uh, got to get back up to uh, game speed. He's still not obviously 100%. The, this Eagles team, they didn't look really good in this game whatsoever. The Minnesota Vikings, Kirk Cousins, I think this is going to end up being his best year as a pro. He looked impressive at times. And uh, we'll see how the Eagles bounce back because I'll tell you this, I don't think it's a lot this week that they're going to beat the uh, the very, very uh, dismal Giants. I can I can actually see an upset in that game. So the Eagles got to get back on track. Hopefully Wentz can find his rhythm, what made him so great from a year ago, because it'd be a shame if he uh, never returns to that elite form. I know this is uh, it's very, very early into his return, but I just want to see him play at that elite level because he was fun to watch last year before going down. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how the Eagles bounce back. And if you're the Vikings, we'll see how they fare this week because once again they're a big big home favorite and we remember the last time that happened right Buffalo Bills spoiled that party (laughs) yes we definitely remember that biggest upset of the year so far Um, for me Philadelphia has the luxury of 
taking their time to get in the rhythm this year because they're in the NFC East, right? And literally every team in the NFC East lost last week. So they had the luxury of being in a bad division where they have time to get in rhythm and still make the playoffs, even if they end up 9-7, and 10-6 and six this year. For Minnesota, their defense hasn't been what we expected. They look good in this matchup until the end where Philadelphia started to come back. But that, that worries me about Minnesota and also their running the game. It's been such a lack of running attack this year. Even last year when Dalvin Cook got hurt, they still were able to run the ball and be balanced last year. This year, that running attack has been non-existent. You know, Dalvin Cook's been in and out of the lineup, but even Latavius Murray, who's a solid back, hasn't been able to get yards for them. So you're putting a lot on Kirk Cousins. And he's been proven able to handle it so far. He does have a lot of weapons there with Thielen and Diggs. But the lack of running attack does worry me for Minnesota. So both these teams have some leaks right now that I'm worried about, but we'll see going forward. For this next matchup, we're not going to spend too much time on it. It's two garbage teams as Arizona beat San Francisco 28-18. Arizona's now 1-4. San Francisco's 1-4. Josh Rosen went 10 for 25, 170 yards, 1 TD. David Johnson had 18 carries for 55 yards, 2 touchdowns. And Kirk, the wide receiver or tight end for Arizona, had three receptions for 85 yards. And I didn't even put San Francisco stats down. Let you know how much I cared about that game. <laughs> but um, Josh Rosen looked okay. You know, Arizona's going to be probably two, three wins. San Francisco's going to be in that same boat this year. So I don't have too much about this matchup. You have any thoughts on this one? Yeah, you, you hit on the head perfectly. This is one of those games that didn't attention too much on i just saw that uh the cardinals got their first one of the season which is nice and josh rose then he looked to uh have a pretty decent stat line and uh yeah i think it's just gonna be a wash season for the niners we already know that obviously jimmy g going down a few weeks ago this is gonna be a year that they just see what they have probably win another game or two if any and uh, for the uh the arizona cardinals i thought they were gonna lose this game so they proved me wrong in this spot uh, it's looking like we're going to have one of the best QB draft classes in quite some time. It's fascinating to see these young kids just be thrown into the starting role this early into their careers and look good out there. And we've seen that through the first five weeks of this NFL season. So for me personally, that's one of the storylines that excites me the most and that I've been following along the most. It's just the development and how quick these quarterbacks have adapted to the NFL style of play. So Josh Rosen, congrats to you. First NFL career win. And uh, I think this Cardinals team, they're obviously not going to be nowhere near a playoff team, but they could probably muster five to six wins this season if Josh Rosen continues to play the way that he did. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. Yeah, that's a very good point about the draft class. It looks very strong right now. No one looks like, you know, ultimate bust or anything like that. Even... You know, Lamar Jackson with Baltimore, I like the situation he's in where he's able to sit behind Joe Flacco this year. So I think this is a, a does have a chance to be one of those draft classes that's remembered for a long time. For the next matchup, we had the L.A. Rams squeak out a victory over the Seattle Seahawks, you know, division rival. They won 33-31. They are now 5-0, and and the Seahawks are now 2-3. and Jared Goff went 23 for... Make sure I had that correct there. 32, 321 yards, one touchdown, two picks. Ty Gurley had three touchdowns on 27 carries for 77 yards. Russell Wilson went 13 for 21, 198 yards, three touchdowns. Chris Carson had 19 carries for 116 yards, which is the way the Seahawks want to play historically. They want to have that running attack, so that was something that looked good for them. But, of course, the Rams were able to pull it out. Very good victory for them as they showed some heart and some grit going forward on that fourth down. You know, we'll talk about Dallas just here in a little bit, not going for it on fourth down. But the Rams look pretty good. I like the way they pulled out that victory in a close one. What are your thoughts on this matchup? The Rams are gutsy, man. They are ballsy. I was shocked when, well, not entirely shocked, but a part of me was shocked because you typically see a team put in that position. But you got to love that, man. McFay and uh, Goff, they're turning into the, uh, I know this is a big, bold prediction from my end, but uh, or statement from my end, but uh, they could be this era's Brady and Belichick. Who knows? They've been a fun tandem to watch. And the, uh, yeah, the ballsy play call there at the end, I was impressed by that. You put your offense back on the field, unlike Dallas, and you just go get the first down to, to, to win the game and to finish the game as they did. Seahawks, got to give him a lot of credit. Russell Wilson, we're going to see games this year 
where he's just going to wilt his Seahawks to wins when not a lot of people are picking the Seahawks to win. They're still a very good home team. Obviously, they don't have the pieces that they once had. They're not a fierce team like they used to be. But this is still a very, very tip-top home team. And I knew they were going to keep it close. The Rams pulled it off. And for as good as this team's looked, I know a lot of people are uh, jumping the gun here and saying this is the greatest Rams team of all time, better than the uh, the greatest show on turf, all that jazz. I still want to see their defense play better because you look at all these games. They've been giving up a whole ton of points and a whole ton of yards. And until I can give them the, the, the crown that this is going to be the team to represent the NFC in the Super Bowl, they got to show me more on the defensive side of the ball. Almost similar to the Chiefs. And those two teams actually play each other later on this season, so that's going to be a fun one. But uh, other than that, they're just finding different ways to win, aren't they? Their offense, superior, best offense in the league, bar none. This is a Rams team that's going to be legit. This is a Rams team that's going to be up there come playoff time as a team that you can take serious as a Super Bowl contender, especially if they can fix up their defense a little bit. But, uh, yeah, this was a highly enter- entertaining game, one of the better games on the week, and uh, we'll see how the Seahawks bounce back, almost getting the job done against an undefeated team. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything you said there. The Rams' defense does have some holes. They don't have much edge rushing. Linebacker core, you know, leaves a little bit to be desired. So I definitely can see the Rams maybe have some troubles later on in the year when people have a little more tape on them and the games get a little lower scoring. So we'll see going forward. For the next matchup, we had the Houston Texans defeat the Dallas Cowboys in the Battle of Texas as they won 19-16. to The Houston Texans are now 2-3. and Dallas is also 2-3. and Dak Prescott went 18 for 29, 208 yards, one touchdown, two picks. Ezekiel Elliott did not have a normal Zeke day as he had 20 carries for only 54 yards. Deshaun Watson went 33 for 44, 375 yards, one touchdown, one pick. Alfred Blue only had 20 carries for 46 yards, so neither team was able to run the ball. DeAndre Hopkins, being a stud that he is, had nine receptions for 151 yards. So I have a a different question for you on this one. A lot of people are calling for Jason Garrett's head. Do you think Jason Garrett's time should be up in Dallas? Yeah, this is uh, definitely one of those things that a lot of the uh, big sports uh, outlets are talking about. I I think so, but I would give him until the end of the season. If uh, the Dallas Cowboys season doesn't turn and uh, they obviously miss the playoffs and uh, don't have a successful campaign, I think think it's time to part ways. Obviously, he has a real good relationship with Jerry Jones. A lot of people say he should have been fired a couple years ago or even last year. I can agree with all of that, but just talking about the present moment, I definitely wouldn't part ways with him now, but uh, this would be the final year I give him if I'm uh, obviously uh, in the head there of the uh, Dallas Cowboys organization because he's been with that organization a while, haven't had the success that they expect there in Dallas, and uh, yeah, that was that to me just a boneheaded call in OT. You guys see on the bench, it's a fourth and one, the exact same situation where the Rams went for it. You gotta give it to Zeke, run the ball, you're gonna get the first down, 90% chance you get the first down in that situation, and you go out to win the game because Dallas, that is a demoralizing loss. They played a heck of a game, it was a good defensive battle, it was the game of the week, in my opinion. I watched this game from start to finish. They should have won that game. And Houston, shout out to them, shout out to Hopkins making that double spin move, setting up uh, Houston for the game when he field goal. But he shouldn't even been on the field because you should have given the ball to Zeke, get the first down, Cowboys win, and we're not talking about Jason Garrett being fired the morning after. So, yeah, this is going to be a very, very, very big year for Jason Garrett, in my opinion. This is do or die, do or die time for him. I, I still think the Cowboys can win this division. But uh, only time will tell. But if you can't get it done, it's goodbye, Garrett. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. And for me, also, I'm looking at Bill O'Brien because the two wins that Houston got were both on the backs of bad decisions by the coaches. So you look at the the win they got against the Colts. You know, their coach went for it on fourth and five, which I respected that he wanted to go for the win instead of going for the tie. But he just gave away that victory to Houston by doing that. In this matchup, if Dallas goes for it on that 4th and 1, they probably make it, like you said, a high chance of making it, even though Zeke wasn't having a good game and that defensive line for Houston is really good. You still have to go for it there. I personally would have did a run. I probably would have did a run option with Dak Prescott 
or you have you know the option for him to run it or Ezekiel Elliott to run up the middle just to provide something different, make sure you get that one yard. But like you said, man, he's making some bad decisions and just hasn't been a quality coach for a while now. So I could definitely see him getting fired at the end of the year, you know, if Jerry Jones is in, is ready to fire someone that he has a good relationship with. For the next matchup, who that said they're going to beat them Saints? As the Saints on Monday night just mollywopped the Washington Redskins 43-19. to The Saints are now 4-1. and The Redskins are 2-2, two and two, but they are in the lead in the NFC East. Drew Brees went 26 for 29, 363 yards, three touchdowns. Mark Ingram had 16 carries for 53 yards, two touchdowns. Traquan Smith, the young rookie for the Saints, had three receptions for 111 yards, two touchdowns. Alex Smith went 23 for 39, 275 yards, one interception. And in this game, there was a lot of history made as Drew Brees is now the all-time leader for passing yards in NFL's history, passing up Peyton Manning and Brett Favre on Monday night. What are your takeaways from this matchup? Oh, I'm so happy, man. I'm, I'm so happy for Drew Brees, one of my all-time favorite quarterbacks. Couldn't have happened to a, a, a nicer, hard-working guy. And that moment he had with his boys and that uh, quote, that line that he had, was just special. St. Goosebumps watching that moment. I did a live reaction to it. I've always been a fan of Drew Brees, man. I've always had a soft spot for your Saints, one of those teams that I always want to see them exceed and succeed in the postseason. And I definitely want to see Brees win another Super Bowl, and uh, spoiler alert, my preseason prediction was that uh, Drew Brees-led Saints were going to win this year's Super Bowl, so I'm hoping that happens, very special moment, it was inevitable that he was going to break this, and Drew Brees is probably going to break a whole bunch of other records, because the special part about this Damien is, he's not even done playing, he's got a lot left in the tank, he's arguably playing his best ball now, the Saints are starting to click on all the faces of the football field. So this is a fun Saints team to watch right now. And like I said, not much more to put into this other than Drew Brees, congratulations. You deserve this. And uh, I'm looking forward to what else he can accomplish this season with this team. Yeah, it was a, a great moment. I joked on a video that I made that you know I got a little teary-eyed watching it. But it was a very, very special moment there. And you know, just happy for Drew Brees. And like you said, he's going to make this record Almost untouchable. It's going to be a while before anybody touches, you know, the yards that he's going to have when he's done. And, you know, he's also, you know, closing in on touchdowns as well. But, you know, Tom Brady is also right there when it comes to touchdowns. Now, for the game, I felt like the Saints played almost a perfect game pretty much. You know, we had one bad turnover, a fumble by Meredith, and a few missed tackles early on. But besides that, man, this was pretty flawless. Offense was just clicking. Um, The running game was okay. It wasn't where we wanted to be, but, you know, it could be better. But when you're passing like Drew Brees was passing, you know, it doesn't affect you too much. Our defense was the question mark, you know, early on in the year after Fist Magic came into the Superdome and just dominated that first week. And we had some other games where our defense just didn't look good. But we started to make some adjustments, started to play more zone. And you kept hearing the term soft zone for the Saints, where we're, you know, putting players in a position to, not let anything get behind them and be in position to come up and make tackles. So it's just on them to make plays now. They're being put in the right position. So I'm very excited about the rest of the year. For Washington, they have to bounce back from this loss. This is very bad. You think about it. It came off a bye week. Yeah. And it was a Monday night game. So you had 15 days to get ready for this matchup. And to still come out and get bombed like that is not a good look at all. You know, Alex Smith... He was feeling the pressure. You could tell that he was second guessing himself in the game. You know, they're running because they got down so fast, they weren't able to use Adrian Peterson and run the ball. They just didn't look good. But like I said, in the FC East, they're right there in the picture. So speaking of Drew Brees, had to do this topic with you since he's, you know, now the all time leader in passing yards. Is he a top five quarterback of all time? So what we're going to do, we're going to top, we're going to count down our top five quarterbacks of all time. Start with number five. Then we'll alternate. So you'll do your number five. I'll do my number five. You'll do your number four. I'll do my number four. So on and so forth. So let's start with your top five quarterbacks of all time. Who do you have at number five? Okay, so uh, I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with John Elway at number five. Now, John Elway, great quarterback. Why do you have him at number five? 
Uh, yeah, it's uh, I have them at number five. Just uh, like you're going to see, a lot of my lists are based on guys that I witnessed with my own eyes, and uh, I have them at number five just because I couldn't leave him off the board. Obviously, the success he had with the Broncos, and uh, it was either between him or Brett Favre. Because as you're going to see, I don't want to spoil my list. I have a couple other guys ahead of him, so uh, I decided to go with uh, Elway at five. Definitely not mad at that pick. My number five, I have Dan Marino. You look at Dan Marino. He was someone who was ahead of his time. You know, he threw for 5,000 yards in 1984. And that's back when the defense was able to pretty much assault the offense back then. But now, you know, those rules have changed a lot. And he was able to throw 5,000 yards back then. Um, He led the league in touchdown passes three times during his career. You know, led the league in passing yards five times during his career. You know, three-time All-Pro. So Dan Marino is my number five. Who do you have at number four? Okay, so can I get back here? Because I was trying to, like, mentally do it in my head, and I completely, I can't believe I completely missed on Dan Marino. So I'm actually going to put Marino as my five. I'm I'm taking Elway off the board. And, uh, yeah, so I have Marino at five, if I'm allowed to do that. Because I'm trying to do this mentally in my head. I'm working on nothing right now in front of me. So I got Marino number five. And then number four is going to be a surprise one. It's actually the guy you just talked about because I think his career is not done yet. He's going to still accomplish a lot of things. I got Drew Brees. For me, it's just what he's been able to do coming off of that big injury. A lot of people thought his career was going to be done after that. And uh, just to see the success he had when New Orleans really uh, reviving that city post, post-Katrina and uh, having the success that, success that he has. I think he's going to finish his career with another Super Bowl. Uh, I, I honestly think he could get the three, but I'll, I'll shoot for two uh, just to be on the safe side. So uh, I'm going to go with your boy Drew Brees at number four. And uh, I also think he's going to like you said, make that record that he just broke untouchable, and uh, he's just going to continue to pad those stats where uh, all he's really going to need is just a couple, like, more Super Bowl wins to really put him into even the top three, and that's what's preventing me from putting him in the top three, is the fact that he's 1-1, but uh, I'll have Breeze at number uh, four. Okay, I'm definitely not mad at that pick. My number four is a four-time Super Bowl champion, Joe Montana. Joe Montana led the league in completion percentage five times he completed 70 percent of his passes in 1989 so to think that you know that's what people are doing now in 2018 he did that in 1989 that's just remarkable like i talk about how you know the rules are so much different back then so for him to be able to do that is a just a mark to how accurate he was you know also led the league in touchdowns twice and he's also his playoff stats are phenomenal you know he had one year where he had you know 11 touchdowns no interceptions you know something about a quarterback having that type of performance in the playoffs with Joe Flacco being able to match that. But Joe Montana, you yeah. know, has done it more than once. So Joe Montana's number four for me. Who do you have at number three? Uh, I'm gonna go with um, I'm gonna go with another guy I went to Salah with my own eyes. Uh, I'm gonna go with Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning in the two Super Bowls, won a uh, Super Bowl with the Colts, of course, won it with the Broncos. I would have him at two and possibly even one. If uh, he had some more Super Bowls to back him up, what more can you say about this guy? Constant success, uh, regular uh, division titles, best record in the in the uh, division and uh, in the conference. Always in those grueling matchups against the Patriots, where of course Brady at times had uh, had his number, had the upper hand in those. This was a guy; he was just uh, a sheriff on the field, the king of the audible. Made everybody around him better. Could throw to guys like me and you and make us look like studs. Peyton Manning was a guy who I grew up watching. And, uh, yeah, I have him at number three. I think uh, if it wasn't, if he had some more Super Bowls on his side, I would honestly say that he he would have been my number one. But because he had uh, he only has the two, um, I'll put him at three. But, boy, you look at the records that uh, that he has. I mean, he has the, the touchdowns record. He had the passing yards record up until Monday. This guy was just something special to watch, and uh, the game truly misses that every Sunday. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything you said there. Now, I'm going to have a shocker at number three with Tom Brady. Now, some people are going to go crazy. Oh. <laughs> now you not have Tom Brady at number one? Now, Tom Brady, I... When we're talking about greatest quarterback of all time, we're talking about the individual quarterback. We're not talking about the team accomplishments. Now, of course, the quarterback has a big impact on team accomplishments. But I believe if you put any of these quarterbacks that we're talking about in 
Tom Brady's position with the Patriots, they also get five Super Bowls and eight Super Bowl appearances. He just happens to be the quarterback of the most dominant franchise of the past 20 years. Doesn't make him the greatest of all time. But I still have him in my top five. You're talking about a three-time MVP, someone who's completed 64% of his passes throughout his career. He's right up there in the top five for passing yards all time. He's led the league in touchdown passes three times, led in passing yards three times. That's 500 touchdown passes to 166 interceptions. That's something that's, you know, his touchdown and interception rate is great. And in the playoffs, has 71 touchdowns compared to only 31 interceptions. So Tom Brady at number three for me. Who do you have at number two? Yeah, number two, I got to go with Joe Montana. You had him uh, previously, obviously the four Super Bowls you touched on, all the great success he had with the, uh, the 49ers. Got to go with uh, Mr. Montana there. But I will say this, off record, Damien actually met Montana um, this past summer. He actually came to Toronto for an event. And uh, this, in my mind, uh, assured that he would never be the number one pick on my board, just over the fact that, I remember I tried reaching out to him, like, hey, do you want to take a picture? And he literally just gave me, like, a stone-cold look, and he just blew me off. So I'm like, come on, man. Really, oh, wow. really, I have an opportunity to take a picture with you, and you're going to you're gonna shun me like that. But, no, yeah, all jokes aside, I uh, I have uh, Montana at number two. And, uh, yeah, I think you, you'll know who I have at number one. But who's your number two? Yeah, it's not, not cool on the picture, Joe. Come on, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, number two, I have Drew Brees. Drew Brees, all-time leader in passing yards now, all-time leader in completion percentage, not only for his career, but as for a single season as well. And some people will say, you know, of course he has the most passing yards. He's passing the most. But if he's passing the most and still has the highest completion percentage, shouldn't that add to how great he is or make the more of a case for how great he is, the fact that he's passing the ball more than you and still completing the ball at a higher percentage? It's amazing. You know, he's led the league in uh, completion percentage four times, led the league in passing yards seven times. And the times he's been in the playoffs, he's performed well. We just haven't had, you know, defenses at times. He's lost some epic matchups. Like, it's not his fault that the Minneapolis miracle happened last year. So that's something that you can't hold against him. It's not his fault that, you know, Alex Smith had one of his greatest games ever against us in the playoffs when he was playing for San Francisco. Those things happen, and it's not on the quarterback. So I have Drew Brees at number two. So I already know who you have at number one. I'm guessing Mr. Brady. I'm going with uh, J.P. Lossman. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going with Mr. Uh, Tom Brady, man. I'm. Uh, I guess you could classify me as. Uh, I don't want to use the word fanboy, but I'm a huge fan of this guy's game. I mean, you look at his story, being drafted where he was, being written off. Because I-, I view myself as an underdog. Up to in uh, in just what I do and, and just I can re- I related to him so well just from that aspect coming in nobody was really talking about him being the best and just looking at what he's been able to accomplish it just it's, it's truly special I mean I grew up watching football when I was around seven years old and and Brady was dominating the league and here I am closing in on 25 and guess what Brady's still dominating the league so it's truly remarkable now a lot can be said like you said about the, the system quarterback, uh, the, the position that he was put into, picture-perfect position. So I agree with you there. But at the end of the day, Tom Brady has still come up with very, very impressive performances when his team needed him the most, most notably that come from behind Super Bowl win against the Falcons. No mistakes he made late in that game. Just the mental toughness this guy has, his competitiveness, his focus, his eagerness to win. It just gets me fired up when, whenever I watch Brady on NFL Sunday. He's just the ultimate competitor, ultimate fierce competitor. And uh, it helps that he has his Super Bowls to back him up to and his uh, league MVP. So i got to go with Mr. Tom Brady as my one. Okay. I'm not upset at that pick. I understand why a lot of people have Tom Brady as the GOAT. But I'll just say some reasons why I believe he's in the top five but not the GOAT for me. The person I have as the GOAT is Peyton Manning. Now, you look at Peyton Peyton Manning, five-time MVP, led the league in passing yards three times, led in completion percentage two times. And I think that his lack of greatness in the playoffs has been overstated. He is someone who completed 63% of his passes in the playoffs. And he's also been the victim of what Drew Brees has been the victim of some years with not having a defense. 
and you can't put down the quarterback. You know, if the quarterback's playing well, but his defense is giving up 40 points, that's not something that the quarterback can control. But I believe Peyton Manning, because Peyton Manning was a system. You know, it's not Tom Brady's fault, or, you know, we shouldn't hold it against Tom Brady. They've been with Belichick this whole time. But Peyton Manning, no matter who the coach was, he was the guy who was pretty much the offensive coordinator. You mentioned how he just gets up to the line of scrimmage, calls the play from there. And, of course, you know, he has offensive coordinators, and they help out. But when you have someone like that who can pretty much run your offense in that way, you can put him in any era. He's going to dominate. So I got Peyton Manning as my number one. Can you recap your top five QBs of all time real quick for the people? Yeah, so uh, top five all time. I got um, Marino, Breeze, Mon- uh, no, Montana at two, Peyton at three, sorry, and uh, Tom Brady. So Marino, Breeze. Payton, Montana, Brady. So for my top five, number five, I had Dan Marino. Four, Joe Montana. Three, Tom Brady. Two, Drew Brees. One, Peyton Manning. So please let us know what you think of the list. And I think I know you guys will have strong opinions on that one. So please let us know. So let's quickly go through week six predictions. I don't want to keep you too long over the time. I told you to have you on here. So we'll do week six predictions real quick, and then we'll get into sports trivia and forgotten players. So for the first matchup on week six, we have Eagles at Giants. I have Philly winning 24-20. How do you see this matchup? Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Philly as well. I think it's going to be a close field goal game, 24-21. Okay. Next matchup, we have Bucks at Falcons. I'm going with Tampa Bay, 35-28. Big game from Jameis Winston. Who you got? Ooh, I can see that happening, but I think the Falcons are going to bounce back. Give me the Falcons 28-17. Next matchup, we have Carolina at Washington. We have Carolina winning 27-17. How do you see this matchup? Yeah, I see Carolina winning 23-20. I think it's going to be another field goal game. Next matchup, we have Seattle at Oakland. We both have the same disdain for Oakland right now. <laughs> I'm going with Seattle 24-16. How do you see this matchup? I'm seeing a blowout here. I'm going to give me 32-7. Ooh. For the next matchup, we have the Colts at the Jets. Very interesting. I have... The Colts winning, and I guess an upset, 27-21. Who you have in this matchup? Yeah, give me the Colts, 21-17. Next matchup, we have Arizona at Minnesota. We've seen Minnesota in this spot before. You mentioned it earlier where they were big favorites. But I think this time they go ahead and take care of business, 27-17. Who you got in this one? Yeah, fun fact, Arizona's actually number one in many. I think many's going to steamroll past uh, Arizona. Uh, give me many, I'll say 28 to 10. For the next matchup, we have Pittsburgh at Cincinnati. These games are known for being extra violent. I don't expect anything less than this one. I'm predicting one ejection and also Cincinnati winning 28 27. How do you, how you see this matchup going? I got Pittsburgh in a close one. So give me Pittsburgh 24, Cincy 23. Okay, so we both have a super close game that can go either way. For the next matchup, very interesting, guys, the Chargers at Cleveland. I'm going with Cleveland, 17-14. Who you got? Give me, uh, give me the Browns, 20-17. to 17. I think they're going to keep it rolling. Next matchup, we have Buffalo at Houston. This one is interesting in the fact that I have no idea who's going to win. <laughs> but I'm going to go with Houston in this one, 21-17. Who you got? Bills are going to make it interesting. Houston's been playing a few goal games, but I think they're going to prevail at the end. Houston 16, Bills 13. How about Houston? For the next matchup, we have Chicago at Miami. I'm going Chicago to win 24-16. to 16. Who you got? Give me the Dolphins. I like the Dolphins 21-13. to 13. Okay. Taking the bold statement there. I like that one. Next one, we have the Rams at Denver. I can see the Rams just running all over Denver in this one. They better come ready for it. But I see Ty Gurley having a big day. 28-15 Rams. Who you got? I think it's going to be a closer game than what people are thinking. I'm going to go Rams 24, Denver 20. Next one, you have your Baltimore Ravens at Tennessee. Very interesting matchup of teams that can both show to be great, but also play down to their competition. But I got Baltimore winning this one 17-10. Who you got? I think the Ravens, are their defense is going to absolutely show up here. I got Ravens 17, Tennessee 6. Okay, and I'm hoping Tennessee can beat up on your Ravens a little bit as we have you guys in Week 7. So we'll see. 
for the next matchup, we have Jacksonville at Dallas. I'm going Jacksonville 27-13. I don't think this one will be close. I think the good Blake Boyles will show up, and Jacksonville's defense will shut down Dallas. So you got I actually have Dallas, man. I have Dallas with the upset. Give me Dallas 17, Jacks 10. Oh, okay. Next matchup, we have the matchup of the week. Kansas City at New England. I'm going Kansas City 28-24. to I don't trust New England's defense to be able to stop Kansas City. Who you got? Okay, I actually, I'm going to have New England here, man. I got New England 35, and I got the Chiefs 23. I think uh, this is going to be a little bit of a, a, a beat down from uh, the Pats. Oh. And for Monday night, it's not a great Monday night matchup as we have the beat down 49ers going against Green Bay. See Green Bay using this as a bounce back game, winning 24 to 14. How do you see this matchup going? Yeah, bounce back game for Rodgers, 28 to 10. Uh, now it's time to do a little sports trivia. This is where I like to test our guests on trivia about their favorite team. Are you ready? All right, let's go. I'll try not to make a fool out of myself. Here we go. <laughs> For the first question, we're going to go with Toronto Raptors trivia. And all the questions are multiple choice. For the, quest- the first question, okay. who is the all-time leader in assists per game for the Toronto Raptors? Is it TJ Ford? Jose Calderon, Damon Stoudemire, or Kyle Lowry? Let me give it to you one more time. Who is the all-time leader in assists per game for the Toronto Raptors? TJ Ford, Jose Calderon, Damon Stoudemire, or Kyle Lowry? Ooh, this is actually a very tough one, man. Um, I'm going to go Lowry, but I, I'm probably wrong. Yes, Kyle Lowry is incorrect. The correct answer is Damon Stoudemire. I knew it. I should have won my initial gut. Damn. Okay, I'm moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so Damon Stoudemire from 1995 to 1998 averaged 8.8 assists per game for the Toronto Raptors. For the next matchup, or the next question, excuse me. Who is the all-time leader in points per game for the Toronto Raptors? Is it Vince Carter, DeMar DeRozan, Chris Bosh or Kyle Lowry? I'm going to give it to you one more time. Who is the all-time leader in points per game for the Toronto Raptors? Vince Carter, DeMar DeRozan, Chris Bosh, or Kyle Lowry? Uh, Carter. Yes, Vince Carter is the all-time leader in points per game. He averaged 23.4 points per game from 1998 to 2004. I think everybody around our age, Vince Carter was that guy around that time, man. Yeah. Definitely just remember fall in love with Vince Carter at that time and trying to do all the things he did and almost hurt myself. <laughs> my, mom never, never, yeah. my mom never lets me forget that time in the backyard I tried to do those dunks and dunk contests and almost broke my leg. <laughs> For the next question, we're going to go to Baltimore Ravens question. Joe Flacco is first in passing yards in Baltimore Ravens history. He pretty much holds all the passing records. So who is second in passing yards for the Baltimore Ravens? Is it Steve McNair, Kyle Bowler, Vinny Testaverde or Tony Banks? Let me give it to you one more time. Joe Flacco is first in passing yards in Baltimore Raven history. Who is second in Baltimore Raven history in passing yards? Is it Steve McNair, Kyle Bowler, Vinny Testaverde, or Tony Banks? I gotta go with the uh, late grade Steve McNair. That's a good guess, but the correct answer is Kyle Bowler. Yes, oh. the <laughs> the guy who was not, you know, did not live up to his first round draft pick. Had 7,846 passing yards from 03 to 07 during his time with the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah, I remember Bowler. Damn, I didn't know. Uh, yeah, that, was, that one caught me off guard. So for question number four, this is a general football question. Tom Brady and Drew Brees are respectively first and second among active quarterbacks in touchdown passes. Tom Brady has 500. Drew Brees has 499. Who is third among active QBs in passing touchdowns? Is it Ben Roethlisberger, Eli Manning? Aaron Rodgers or Phillip Rivers? Let me give it to you one more time. Tom Brady and Drew Brees are respectively first and second among active quarterbacks and touchdown passes. Who is third among active QBs? Is it Ben Roethlisberger, Eli Manning, Aaron Rodgers, or Phillip Rivers? That's a tough one. Mm. I'm going to go with uh, Rivers. That's probably wrong. No, it actually is correct. Phillip Rivers is third among active QBs in touchdown passes with 355. Oh, I guess I got one, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. 
So, now you did pretty good, man. You went two for four. So here's a recap That's of the trip. Some tough questions, man. Eh? I, I like it. I, I gotta, I gotta be honest though. I'm very, very mad about the first one. I shouldn't, I should have known it was uh, my man, uh, Mighty Mouse, Damon Stott, uh, Damon Stott, and I, I, I overthought that one, but definitely good questions, man. You stumped me here. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. So here's a recap of the questions for the people. Number one, who is the all-time leader in assists per game for the Toronto Raptors? It is Damon Stoudemire, who averaged 8.8 assists per game from 95 to 98. Question number two, who is the all-time leader in points per game for the Raptors? It's Vince Carter, of course, of course with 23.4 points per game from 98 to 2004. Now, question number three, Joe Flacco is first in passing yards for the Baltimore Ravens in their history. Who is second? Is Kyle Bowler. Talking about a forgotten player right there. 7,846 passing yards during his time with the Ravens. And question number four, Tom Brady and Drew Brees are first and second respectively among active QBs and touchdown passes. Who is third among active QBs? It's Phillip Rivers with 355. So thank you for being a good sport during sports trivia. So now it's time for us to do forgotten players. Forgotten players is where we pay homage to players who may have been good but not great, great but not recognized. Or players who you may have just forgotten about who we want to remind you of. Who is your forgotten player today? Yeah, this is a good one. I'm going to go with uh, a guy. When we talk about Damien uh, players of the uh, being the goat of this decade, we always talk about you know Kobe Bryant, LeBron James. I'm going to talk about uh, a guy by the name of uh, Tim Duncan. Just what he was able to do, the big fundamental, uh, five-time champion, uh, you know, 15-time defensive player, or all-defensive team. A multiple-time All-Star. This guy embodied the workhorse, being humble type of player that, uh, that that doesn't really get promoted a lot. You know, you look at the, today's sports world, a lot of these very vocal, over-the-top players are uh, recognized and the media covers the most. But uh, Tim Duncan did it the right way, man. He won, didn't say a lot, very humble. And uh, you look at all the success the San Antonio Spurs had while he was there, it speaks for itself. And I think when we talk about the uh, the greatest player of this decade or of the twenty two thousands, Tim Duncan's name doesn't come up nearly enough because obviously we talk about you know the Kobe Bryant's of the world, the Shaquille O'Neal's of the world, uh, even LeBron kind of falls in the that whole conversation since he was drafted in two thousand and three. But uh, I got to give some love to Timmy D. He was definitely uh, one of those guys that uh, I grew up watching, and his uh, success speaks, uh, speaks for itself. We got to give him more recognition when talking about uh, this decade's great. Uh, the, the grades from this decade. I definitely agree with that. He's someone who gets overlooked in that conversation, and we always acknowledge him as the greatest power forward of all time, but when you speak of greatest players of all time, he should be in that conversation as well. The big fundamental, like you say, was a pillar on both offense and defense, five-time champion. And in basketball, when you're the best player on a championship team, you know, five or four or five times, he was the best player on that team. You just got to give respect to that. Now, for my forgotten player, I went basketball as well, but I took it took it back. I went a little further back in history for my forgotten player. Went with a guy named Chuck Robinson. Now, Chuck Robinson is originally from Jacksonville, Florida. He was a second-round pick in the 1974 in the NBA draft by the Washington Bullets. He was coming out of Tennessee State University. He was a 6'7 power forward. He played 11 seasons in the NBA for the Bullets, Knicks, the New Orleans Jazz at the time. Phoenix and Atlanta. He averaged 15.5 points per game, 9.4 rebounds per game while shooting 48% from the field. He was a two-time All-Star. He had his best season for the New Orleans Jazz in the 77-78 season where he averaged 22 points per game and 15 rebounds. Just out there dominating at 6'7", getting 15 rebounds a game is just dumb. Um, He also shot 44% from the field and had one block per game during that time. So big shout out to Tim Duncan and Chuck Robinson as our forgotten players today. I hope you had a good time on the show, man. Yeah, it was great, man. I, I love this. In terms of structure, going down everything, I love those trivia questions you pulled up. And uh, definitely great forgotten player. But uh, all in all, really good time. And this was fun, man. Definitely got to have you on my podcast one time. Thanks again, Damien, for allowing me to be on your show. Oh, no problem at all, man. I always love to have knowledgeable guests on. You definitely fit that criteria. Please tell people where they can follow you on social media. Yeah, you can hit me up on uh, main platform, uh, as I said at the top of the show, YouTube, The Waterboard Report, Instagram, my handle is The Waterboard Report, and Twitter is just Waterboy Report, no uh, at the beginning. And uh, yeah, feel free whenever you guys want to connect. 
<coughs> excuse me, Connect Talk Sports. Um, definitely hit me up. Yes, follow him. Subscribe to the Water Bar Report on YouTube. Like I said, he gets live reactions. Great podcast. He touched on everything in sports. I'm a big fan. Make sure you check him out. For me, make sure you follow me at the Real Deal W D A. That's on Twitter and Instagram. And make sure you f- subscribe to the podcast, The Real Deal with Damian Adams, on iTunes, Spreaker Radio, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, The Real Deal with Damian Adams, where you can catch me doing a little bit of everything talking, dancing, just having a good time. So make sure you check that out as well. Until next time, go real or go home. <laughs>